Good morning and welcome <clears throat> to Northwoods Presbyterian Church. Hebrews 12 begins, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us. We are so thankful that all of you are gathered together as we join together as the family of God to worship. We welcome you and we pray that you feel God's strength and love and grace as we worship together this morning. We ask all of you worshiping with us online to please register your worship attendance with the link in the comments section. And for all of you who have gathered here this morning, thank you for being here and thank you for checking in with our greeters as you came in this morning. Today is a special day in the life of the church. Today is All Saints Day. It's a day to remember those who have gone before us, to remember and give thanks for their lives. If you have a family member who is being remembered today, we invite you after the service to go to our library and we have a white rose for each family there for you this morning. While we are recognizing and remembering our members who have died in the last year, we are also very aware that many have lost loved ones recently. And it's our hope and prayer that our service today will be an opportunity for all of us to remember and to give thanks for someone we love who has died. For we trust that in life and in death, we belong to God. Our Contemporary Issues class meets on Sundays at noon through Zoom. Today, we are welcoming Special Agent Laura Brunstetter of the FBI. She will not be here to take me away, but she will be here to talk about <laughs> preventing and detecting frauds and scams. And the link for this can be found on the homepage of our website. We are very thankful for your continued and your generous support and for all who have turned in their commitment cards for next year. We encourage all of our members to turn in commitment cards either in person or online this is a way to respond to God's blessings in our lives and an act of giving thanks. Next week, we will have an amazing reception for me. <laughs> Look, there's two of me. <laughs> Um, so we hope, um, I hope you'll join us. It is going to be a time of saying words of thanks and love and appreciation. I'm hoping there might be a little chocolate around. And um, so I hope you'll join us next week for that. It'll be right after our worship service. Friends, there are saints among us. Let us stand and worship God and sing our opening hymn. <laughs>
So let's read together from Hebrews chapter 12. A huge cloud of witnesses is all around us. So let us throw off everything that stands in our way. Let us throw off any sin that holds on to us so tightly and let us keep on running the race marked out for us. Let us keep looking to Jesus. He is the one who started this journey of faith and he is the one who completes the journey of faith. So let's go back to the beginning. A huge cloud of witnesses is all around us. What does that mean? They are followers of Jesus who have gone before us. If you read the previous chapter of Hebrews, you will see a list of names of people who follow Jesus and love Jesus with all of their heart. And if you look around the room here today, you will see people around you that also love and follow Jesus. They are the great cloud of witnesses today. Next, we are told to throw off anything that stands in our way. For runners, they try not to wear too much bulky clothing because it might slow them down when they run. So it's the same thing with following Jesus, but what could stand in our way? Well, the things that could distract us from following Jesus. So what that is for you might be different than what it is for me. For me, it can often be my cell phone and playing games and getting distracted by stuff on here. For you, it might be video games or it might even be thinking thoughts that aren't from God. So the writer of Hebrews says to throw off these things. Picture something heavy on your back. That's like your distraction and to throw it off. And the writer says that includes any sin that might try to hold tightly onto us. So maybe you have a hard time telling the truth or holding on to things that aren't yours. These things get in the way of living God's way and we need to throw them off. And as we do that, the writer says to keep running the race that's marked out for us. What is this race marked out for us? That's the way of Jesus. God calls us all to treat life like a race where Jesus is the finish line. And Jesus can also be our role model because he ran that race. We may not always be able to see the course so clearly, but we can follow Jesus and also the example of other people around us.
children out here would like to go with Mr. Daniel or Miss Teresa to Sunday school. Have fun. One of the biggest challenges we find in the Gospels is Jesus' call to forgive others. It is always very hard to put forgiveness into practice. One of the organizations that Northwoods has been supporting for years, which deals with forgiveness on a daily basis, is Hand in Hand School in Israel. They have made the brave choice to create spaces for Palestinian and Israeli to go beyond all resentments and hatreds between these two cultures, building friendships, supporting one another, and creating a peaceful environment. The following video will show you the impact they are doing in that complex context. I hope you can enjoy the video. Thank you. Hello, I'm Tomader. I live in Arabi. Hi, my name is Mirav Benoun. I live in Haifa with my family. Hello, my name is Yusuf Shaheen. I live in Haifa. My name is Tiko. I live in Lavon in the north of Israel. It was nine years ago. We were sitting in an old garage, which was actually where our preschool, our first preschool was. We had only 12 kids. And we were talking about how we want to celebrate the holidays together. And it was then that we realized that we can't just have our kids come together and play together. As adults, we need to have friendships and relationships. And we started the community. My children go to Shahar and Juja, a Jewish family, and they play at their home and they come to us, and it's normal. It has been a difficult time all around the world in the corona, and also in our community. When my family was in isolation, my son got sweet package from his uh, friends in class, and my friends called me all the time. I didn't feel alone. Together with our community, we organized food packages for all the families that were uh, struggling at that period. We have neighbors on either side of our home, Ruti and Eli, they're a Jewish family, and Basma and Alan, an Arab family, and they realized that they had never met each other and they never knew each other's names. Hand-in-hand -hand families bring people together. It's uh, much beyond than just doing fun, right? It's uh, more about talking and understanding each other, the political view and, and um, how, how they feel and how we feel about living here in this one state. And then this, uh, this way of understanding, it builds the relations and the community much better. Every time there's a conflict, Palestinian-Israeli conflict, we as adults, Jews and Arabs, come and we talk about it. It's a process, but we do it together. In our community, we look around to see where we can make a stand, where we can raise our voice to make a change. Being part of Hand in Hand, I saw my kids celebrating at school both Jewish, um, Muslim and Christian holidays. I work for an IT company and we celebrate only Jewish holidays. What we did is we decided to celebrate Ramadan and we invited uh, a Muslim engineer to come and tell to the entire side, this is about 200 engineers. If I was not seeing it at school, it wouldn't have happened, right? That's amazing and I'm sure there are many other parents that see similar stuff and bring it to other places of their life. I chose the school to get the best education for my child, but I ended up with a great, great gift for myself. People around us are seeing that. They want to join us. Our community is growing. If it can work in hand in hand, it can work all over the country. Good morning. Um, a quick reminder, um, our Warcraft store will restart actually after two years. So Eunice has been working very hard to get uh, this store started. I hope you can stop by after the service. Let's pray together. Dear God, God of Jesus Christ, we come this morning to worship together as every Sunday, longing to hear your voice and feel your presence. We have heard about your promises of joy and peace, but when we hear and watch the news, we become anxious and skeptical about our future. And we know, Lord, it shouldn't be that way. So forgive us this lack of faith, our quickness to believe that you do not hear us, and our pessimism about tomorrow. And remind us today as we worship you how many blessings we enjoy every day. Remind us that you are in control of our lives and that you will always have the last word in our history. 
as we face challenges that make us be afraid and anxious, let us feel, Lord, above all, you are comforting presence, and let us be still, peaceful, knowing that you alone are God, our God, the creator of the universe, and that you are here with us. We ask, Lord, for this congregation, let us be a witness to your gospel, a loving, supportive community reaching out to those in need. As you showed your steadfast love to us in Jesus Christ, help us to love not just in words but in deed. Love for our neighbors who are hard to love. Love for newcomers in our community. Love for people who are cast out by others. Strengthen those among us who face heavy burdens, who live with pain, especially those who have lost a loved one, that you may console and heal their broken hearts. God of life, we want to thank you for the gift of eternal life and for all those who, having served you well, rest now in your eternal presence. May we learn how to walk wisely from their examples of faith, dedication, and love. We pray this together as people longing for peace, your peace, that peace that passes all human understanding, saying the words Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Lord, forgive us for our pride when our faith becomes a show. Dressed in righteous deeds to hide all the stains below. We have judged your sons and daughters for the sin that is our own. May we now forgive each other and lay down our stones. Forgive. Forgiven through the blood of Christ, we are forgiven. Lord, forgive us for our love of the things we wish to own. We forsake the feast above for all the crumbs below. Though you've made us sons and daughters. We do not the world disown. May we find our greatest treasure is in you alone. Forgiven, forgiven. Through the blood of Christ, we are forgiven. Forgiven, forgiven. Lord, forgive us for our shame when we can't release the past, when we're quick to take the blame, but forget we're free at last. We avoid your sons and daughters for the fear we don't belong. Give us eyes to see each other through your only son. Forgive. Forgiven through the blood of Christ, we are forgiven. Forgiven, oh, forgiven through the blood of Christ.
Today we remember All Saints Day. For Presbyterians, this is a day when we remember God's power to work in and through us to do great works, to forgive us and to raise us to new life. We remember that we do not walk this path alone, but follow in the paths of those who have gone before us. And we remember the thin line between this life in the next. With thanksgiving, let us remember those in our church family who have died this last year. Eternal God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come. We praise you for the saints of all times and places who have walked the road of faith before us and beside us. We thank you for those who have shown us your love, taught us your word, and exemplified a life of faith. We especially honor the memory of those who have lived among us and shared their faith in personal ways and who have now finished the race. We thank you for their life and love and give thanks for the assurance that for them, death is swallowed up in victory. Merciful God, we give you thanks for Phyllis Christopher, <clears throat> Scott Garrison, Linda Honig, Joyce Howes, Bob Kimball, Jim Mathis, Barbara Millette, Anna Lou Parker, Ruth Quantz, Betty Ann Shower, Furman Champ, 
Mary Ann Stallings, Sylvia Washer, Jenny Wessinger. Loving God, we thank you for the gift of life eternal. While we have named those members of our congregation, we also know many others who have lost loved ones. I invite you in the quiet of this moment to give thanks for a person of importance in your own life. Holy God, we give you thanks for all the saints in all our lives, those who are living and those held tenderly in our memory. God, shape us into the saints you would have us to be. And as we turn to your scripture, we pray that you would open our hearts and minds to your spirit. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from Hebrews chapter 12. Let us listen to the word of God. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every sin and the weight that clings so closely and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such hostility against himself from sinners so that you may not grow weary or lose heart. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> we are indeed surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. As I watched our video today and as I think back over All Saints days past, I know that our lives have been impacted in powerful ways by the saints of Northwoods. I think of those singing in the choir, serving on ministry teams, creating our pottery for communion, hosting Christmas parties. I think of their service to our church and our community, growing up in Sunday school and youth group. I think of their years of commitment to marriages and children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. I think of their sharp minds and their laughter and their smiles and the light in their eyes. I think of how they have impacted my life and the life of our church family. I am deeply thankful for the saints of Northwoods, those past and present who have lived a life of faith. And I love this vision that the writer of Hebrews gives us that that great cloud of witnesses isn't all that far off. They surround us, and they're active. In an article on this passage in Hebrews, the author compares the great cloud of witnesses to sports fans in a stadium. They have finished their race, but they do not lose interest in those of us who are still struggling and running. They urge them on and applaud them. That is how these witnesses support our faith. It's a powerful image, isn't it? Barbara Brown Taylor says, We have all this company calling out our names, shouting out encouragement, because we are a part of them and they are a part of us. We are all knit together in that great communion of saints. We have the same blood running through us, Christ's blood. And the same light that we see shining in their eyes shines in us too. This great cloud of witnesses is not passive, but it's on the move. And we are a part of it. When I realized that I would be preaching my last sermon at Northwoods on All Saints Day, 
It felt a little weird and also oddly appropriate. One of the most meaningful parts of my ministry is sharing in your lives. It's walking with you on those mountaintops and it's meandering together in the depths of dark valleys. I don't really know how to express how thankful I am for being invited into your lives and for the ways that you have trusted me. I do not take that lightly. In the midst of all of the ups and downs that we have shared, what always gives me hope is knowing this deep connection and that none of us walk this path alone. We are connected to each other and we are connected to the Lord our God. God's love and grace sustain us and bring out the best in us. For what makes us saints is not anything that we conjure up on our own. It is a gift from God. For even the best of us, even these great saints, struggled with that sin that clings so closely and the weight of our earthly lives. Which makes our sermon series right now, these life-saving words, so important. I'm sorry. And today's words, I forgive you. We know words have power, don't we? We know it's catchy to say, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. But we also know it's true to say, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can break my heart. Our words can hurt or heal. They can discourage or they can inspire. They can destroy or they can build up. God spoke the world into being. What are our words bringing into being now? Last week, Paul preached on saying, I'm sorry. Those can be hard words, can't they? To recognize how our words or actions brought injury to someone else, to recognize that we were wrong or to know that we have hurt someone, and then to say that out loud, it's hard. But that's not the only hard part. When those words are said to us by someone who has hurt us, we have choices about what to do with those words. We can pass judgment about whether or not they're sincere. We can try to decide if they're penitent enough we can hold on to our hurt and anger, or we can let it go. We can forgive. Forgiveness isn't easy. We have a lot of choices about what to do with our pain. Father Richard Rohr says that you can tell a lot about a person by looking at what they do with their suffering. Do they transmit it or transform it? In a sermon on forgiveness, Nadia Boltz Weber says, It's true that God may not prevent evil, and we may never fully understand why. But God does have a way of combating evil. And it's not punishment, it's not retaliation or fear or anger. It's forgiveness. Forgiveness is God's way of combating evil. She said, of course, this offends our impulse for justice and retaliation, but that's God revealed in Jesus. Like it or not, this is what we see at the cross. Our scripture for today says, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken a seat at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such hostility against himself from sinners 
so that you may not grow weary or lose heart. Nadia continues, at Calvary, God allows our human system of scapegoating and fear and retaliation to play its natural course, which ends as it always does, in God's suffering. And then in turn, God shows us God's system by not even lifting a finger to condemn those who put Jesus there on the cross, but instead proclaims of all things forgiveness. In doing so, God cuts the world loose from our own sin because God can't stand to see us chained to it. At Calvary, we see our God entering deeply into the suffering caused by human evil and saying, this ends here. I will not transmit it. It's about forgiveness. When I began here almost 17 years ago, cell phones were just getting started. And there was this tension about how available we ministers should be. So I had a colleague in Florida where I was coming from who said, there is no crisis where my presence as a pastor is going to change the outcome. What I heard him saying was that when people are in a real crisis, they need the real professionals. They need EMTs, they need doctors, nurses, firefighters. So as I started here at Northwoods, I decided that I was not going to be chained to my flip phone. That's how long I've been here. It was a flip phone, people. So I thought I will respond to people in a timely, but not an immediate way. A couple of months after I had started, I was out with the kids. We were visiting some family friends. I put my phone in my purse, and I didn't really think much about it. We had dinner, we visited, it started getting late. We drove like 30 minutes home. I put the kids to bed and I pulled out my phone. And there was a message from a family from the church. They had called me, the pastor on call, because they were experiencing a crisis and I had missed it. By the time I called them back, the hospital chaplain had helped them through that part of the crisis. But I felt terrible. The next day was my day off. But I went up to church to confront my new boss, Pastor Paul, to tell him what had happened. I found out later Paul was already a little suspicious of me. You see, I loved watching a couple of different soap operas, and he thought that maybe that was a sign that I wasn't the hardest worker out there. <laughs> but even with that lingering doubt and no track record between the two of us, when I came into his office to confess my misdeeds that the pastor of nurture had not nurtured there was no shame, no punishment, no disgrace. There was grace and there was forgiveness. Together we made a plan about how to move forward and how I would follow up with this family and offer care from that moment on. And in that experience, I learned two important things that have impacted my ministry and will continue to impact my ministry. I learned that Paul and that Northwoods was a place of grace and forgiveness. I learned that I could make mistakes and be human and still work together and move forward. I learned what grace and forgiveness felt like lived out in practical ways. I learned that what we say as our mission statement is true. We are Christ's disciples celebrating God's grace, creating community, making a difference. This is who we are. 
And time and time again, I have seen you extend that grace to me, to each other. It's who we are as the body of Christ. It's about forgiveness and new life and moving forward together. The other thing I learned is that my colleague was wrong. There are crises that happen where my presence as a pastor and all of our presence as a brother or sister in Christ makes all the difference. By just showing up, we remind people that God is with them and that they are a part of the family of God who is in it with them too. They are not alone and they are loved. One of my favorite shows right now is Ted Lasso. It's not appropriate for all ages. It's about a football coach from Kansas City who goes to England to coach a Premier League soccer team. In one episode, the team has a devastating loss. And so Ted's in the locker room with this broken down team and he says, now look, this is a sad moment right here for all of us. There ain't nothing I can say standing in front of you right now that can take that away. But please do me this favor, will you? Lift up your head and look all around this locker room. Look at everybody else in here. And I want you to be grateful that you are going through this sad moment with all these other folks. Because I promise you, there is something worse than being sad. And that's being alone and being sad. And not one of you here is alone. If I have done nothing else in my time here at Northwoods, I hope I've reminded you, you are not alone. And I hope I've given you the experience of being able to be that for someone else. Because it's who we're called to be as the body of Christ. I hope you've been able to experience being that for someone else. Whether it's making a hospital visit, making a care call, delivering home communion, seeing a family receive a home from Habitat, taking a meal to a friend, delivering a bed to a child who's been sleeping on the floor, seeing a Sunday school class rally around someone who's going through a tough time, or seeing a youth who finally gets to feel comfortable and opens up. There are so many places and ways to be Christ's presence for someone else and to remind each other that we are a part of the body of Christ and every single part is important and treasured and loved. After my experience missing that call, I became determined that I would never save a life but I would do whatever I could to show up. A book that has really resonated with me is this odd and wondrous calling. It's written by two ministers, Lillian Daniel and Martin Copenhaver. At one point, Martin says, a parishioner called to tell me that another member, Jim, had been taken to the hospital. He assumed that I would go to be with him to comfort him and to pray with him. And I shared that same assumption. <clears throat> when I got off the phone, <clears throat> I simply got in my car and headed to the hospital because it's what I do. It's not something I would choose to do on my own, but it is something that is expected of me by virtue of my calling. Now here's the catch with this particular visit. 
Jim was someone who had been relentlessly critical of Martin's ministry. Martin goes on to say, the church, like family, is a place where we try to learn to love those that we're stuck with. Sorry, family, I don't mean that about (laughs) y'all. Of course, we're not always able to pull it off. But in those times when we are able to live with, and sometimes even love those we are stuck with, the church can still give us glimmers of the love of God who's stuck with all of us. He then says, I now think I understand why Jesus tells his followers to act in particular ways, regardless of how they feel at the time. He focuses on actions because most often, as Paul says, we act our way into a new way of thinking and feeling rather than the other way around. Martin said, I am grateful that the pastoral vocation and I would add the Christian vocation, requires us to act in ways that seem beyond us. Is God calling you to act in ways that seem beyond you? Is there someone you need to forgive? Is there someone you need to reach out to who needs to be reminded that they are not forgotten? that they are a part of this body, the family of God. One of our congregational care team members shared that there was a small group of them talking about what would happen after I leave. And she said they decided that what they want to do is take some of the warmth and the care that they feel they have received from me and share that with others. And here's the thing. I know you're going to do that because it's who Northwoods is. We've got great leadership with Paul and David and our session and our staff. And it's who we are as the body of Christ. It's the gift that was given to me when I first started here. It's the gift we give to each other and then we pass it on. And we do it because we're looking to Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. And it's what we see Jesus doing time and time again, saying, come, come to the table, come be a part of the body. You are welcome here. You are loved. You are treasured. You are valued. So may we all keep looking to Jesus. May we all keep forgiving. May we all keep welcoming others. And Northwoods, thank you. I almost made it. (laughs) Thank you for years of love and forgiveness and grace. I came prepared, but I forgot to buy waterproof mascara. (laughs) Ah, Thank you for loving me and our family, for raising our kids. We did it. (laughs) We love you, and we will miss you, and we will keep you in our prayers. May God bless you. All right, Todd, take it away.
Friends, it's all about grace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with us all now and evermore. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. Ooh.